Now that we have proven the possibility of miracles, our next step is to ask for any miracle, what is the probability that it occurred? And this is a different question because just because something is possible doesn't mean you should believe it happened. There are plenty of things that are possible that are highly unlikely. A great example is, say for example, you find someone's DNA on a knife and you find cuts on their hands and the knife was the one that was used to kill someone. And it's highly unlikely that someone other than the person who had the DNA didn't do it. Now you might say, yes, but they might have an identical twin. Yes, that's possible. Maybe even an identical twin that they don't know about. But it's so highly improbable that we shouldn't believe it. And so thus, the question about miracles takes a new step. We can't just simply say, all right, now that we know miracles are possible, the next step is to examine historical evidence, what kind of eyewitness testimony, these kinds of things. And the reason why is because we're going to demand different evidence depending on what we call the intrinsic possibility of an event. Say, for example, I tell you that I flew across New York last night, went around the Empire State Building several times, and then landed back in Georgia. Now, obviously, you're going to demand evidence for that. In fact, I don't think any amount of evidence is going to convince you unless you have a video or something showing that. And even then, you're going to think special effects. Why? Because even though technically speaking, that might be possible, maybe I've invented some backpack some that is able to make me fly in the air without a need for an airplane or, or a helicopter. Nonetheless, it's such an, an intrinsically impossible, improbable event that the standard of evidence that you're going to ask for is way higher than if I told you I walked to the store down the block yesterday. So thus, we can't really judge the historical probability of an event until we judge what is called its intrinsic probability. Historians nowadays, for example, when they examine the origins of Christianity, they're going to see things like the supernatural as so intrinsically impossible that they're, going to ex they're not going to even resort to it unless every natural explanation is proven to be false. So our question is, how do you judge the intrinsic probability of an event? Now, David Hume is very famous for giving an argument that no matter how much evidence you have for a miracle in history, it will never be enough to compete with the natural explanation for that same event even if the natural explanation on ordinary terms is absurd. And here's why he says this. He says, look, miracles are by definition exceptions to the rule. They're tampering with nature. They're not the way things normally go. And so by definition, they're rare, rarer than any other natural event. So it follows, therefore, that natural events are what normally occur. Miracles are what don't normally occur. So therefore, a natural event will always be more probable than a miracle. Now, if you're rational, you're going to apportion your belief to the level of probability that something occurred. If something is intrinsically more probable than something else, then it's more rational to believe the more probable thing than the less probable thing. And therefore, it follows that it will always be more rational to believe the natural explanation of why people believe that Jesus rose from the dead than the supernatural explanation that he actually rose to, from the dead. Group hallucination, all sorts of things, lies. And so no miracle story, Hume tells us, is to be believed because miracles themselves are so intrinsically improbable that they're more likely to have lied or been mistaken than for the story to actually be true. Now, Lewis thinks this all depends on how you're going to judge the intrinsic probability of an event. How does Hume do it? Well, he does it in a very common sense way. The more something has occurred in the past, the more probable it will happen again, or has happened in the past. The more 
The less something has happened in the past, the more rare it is, the less probable it will happen again or that it's happened in the past. But this is a terrible way to judge probability because if we use this argument, what follows is that events that have occurred only once are by Hume's own argument so incredible that you should never believe they occur. There can never be enough evidence. So let's take, for example, winning Powerball. The odds of you winning Powerball are so incredible that you have more of a chance of being struck by lightning twice in the same day than you winning Powerball. You have more of a chance of going randomly to your garbage pail, checking in the garbage and finding a million dollars than of winning Powerball on average. Does that follow that if someone wins Powerball, we have a report that someone wins Powerball, that Troy wins Powerball, that therefore you should never believe it, no amount of evidence is ever going to be enough to convince us? There are also events which are singular, which means that they can only occur once. For example, the Big Bang. The Big Bang is something that it's highly probable that it occurred only once and can never occur again. So does it follow that because it can only occur once in over 15 billion years of every event, that therefore we should not believe it happened, that no amount of evidence can ever convince us that that's the more probable occurrence than that the universe is eternal? Obviously not. Scientists think it's highly probable, even if we end up showing that it's not true. And so probability can't simply be judged by how many times an event has occurred. Rare events could sometimes be more probable than events that occur over and over time. Let me give you an example. I teach college, and so therefore, during the semester, I have a schedule of classes. Now, if you were to wanted to find where I, was most, where I would most likely be at <clears throat> 1240 on Tuesdays and Thursdays, what you would be advised to do is look at the schedule, right? And you would find that I teach a class in, in, in O'Hare, building O'Hare in Salve Regina University between 12.30 and 1.45. And that I'm always there, I've never been absent in the past, I've never been late, and I've never let class out early. So from that, you would then infer that at, on Tuesday, today, at 1240, that I should be in O'Hare right now teaching this class. The problem is, is that you would be wrong. The probability would not be high now. You know why? Because that was the schedule for the spring semester. Change the schedule and you change the probabilities, don't you? And since the schedule is what is going to, you're going to need to use to judge the probability of where I'm going to be on any particular day, then you cannot judge where I'm going to be, the probability, until you know the schedule. And you can't judge the probability of how often the schedule is going to occur. That's going to be different. Since all of your judgments about probability depend on this background ordering of nature then, it can, you cannot even judge the probability of singular versus many events <clears throat> until you know what the schedule looks like. So for example, say the semester ends on May 15th. It doesn't, but let's just say it did because that's the only thing I can think of right now. And so the last day of class is May 15th. And say May 15th is a Wednesday. And then Thursday, I no longer had that schedule. Now, imagine someone argued that for the last four months, Troy has followed this schedule of being in O'Hare 102 at 1240, and that he was there 100% of the time on Thursdays at 1240. Then they argued, therefore, it follows that since last Tuesday, he was also there, Tuesdays and Thursdays, he always has had this regular pattern of behavior, that therefore this coming Thursday, May 16th, he will be there. It doesn't even follow with a high probability, does it? Because the schedule just changed. And so therefore, the frame 
through which I judge the probability of where I'm going to be has ended, and therefore all judgments about probability based on that frame end. The schedule changes, the probability changes. Think of nature's order like a schedule, a regular ordering of events. Probability, judgments of probabilities of how likely the occurrence of any particular event will all be based on this background general order of events. And so we cannot judge the probability of the occurrence of any particular event, whether it happens many times, like I just gave you, this has happened many times, but it doesn't follow, therefore it's probable, or whether it occurred once, even then it doesn't follow that it's improbable without understanding the ordering, the scheduling. Again, it is highly likely, given the schedule next semester, that a singular event that occurs only once in the semester, and in fact in the year, will occur the day after Labor Day at my school. It's called convocation. It can only occur once because it begins the semester and it only begins the fall semester. We don't have a convocation in spring. But given the schedule, it is high, not only highly probable that it will occur, it is highly unlikely that it won't occur. Even though what? It's rare. It can only occur once. Convocation, if it occurs at all, can only occur once in a school year. Now imagine I say it can only occur once, therefore it's highly unlikely that convocation will occur. Then I am just reasoning poorly. So the question that Lewis wants to ask Hume is this. How are you going to judge the probability of the regularity behind nature that you appeal to as an example of what makes events probable versus improbable? In a universe with a God that's all-powerful and that has the possibility of intervening in nature at any time, and in a universe where nature is meant to be intervened with, the probability of a miracle will be very different than in a nature that's completely closed off. And so, Hume cannot simply appeal to the rarity or regularity of an event to determine for any particular event its probability. Otherwise, his argument becomes too good, and every event in history becomes so improbable you should never believe it, since events, in their particularity, can only occur once.